As some of our listeners know, I'm from Colorado. And so when you think of Colorado, you probably picture really excellent skiing and outdoor activities. Maybe it was the first state to localize weed. Um, so it's not really the first place that would come to mind when they try and imagine someplace scary. But as beautiful and laid back as Colorado seems, it's got a pretty unforgiving and unhospitable edge to it. Beyond all the popular ski resorts and local breweries, there's vast remote prairies. There's the formidable Rocky Mountains and the Colorado Front Range. The weather can change suddenly. You can start off on a hike one morning, beautiful and sunny, only to be in the middle of a snowstorm by the early afternoon, stuck wearing shorts, cut off from all help, with no cell reception. So Colorado may not have the colonial spooks like the Jersey Devil or specters like the ghost pirate ships that you hear about on the East Coast. Instead, Colorado horror is born out of a sense of isolation, realizing that what you expected to be normal actually isn't. It's just like that nasty shift from a sunny day to sudden snow. Colorado horror to me is that slow burn where you think you're safe in some mundane place only to find out you've become stranded. You've wandered a bit too far away from your herd and now you're lost with nothing around you for miles. The sun is setting and snow is starting to fall. Take for instance, Riverdale Road. A 11 mile thoroughfare connecting the town of Thornton to Brighton. Now there's not a lot to it. It's a rural road and it's just that, it's a road. There's not a lot happening in those 11 miles. There's agricultural farm that's just starting to get built up by land developers. There's homes popping up, fences, skeletal trees. Riverdale Road is just sort of plain and desolate. You should check it out on Google Maps. If you were driving, there's a good chance you wouldn't be overwhelmed by its scenery. The road itself, just two lanes. It does have some tight turns, but nothing too dangerous. That is until you learn it's been referenced as one of America's most haunted locations. This little mundane stretch of 11 miles that looks like the normal way just to get someplace, by all counts, is pretty deceiving. A lot of places are known for just that one phenomena, like your Jersey Devil or your Mothman, but not Riverdale Road. Oh no, just like Skinwalker Ranch in Utah, it's filled with weird events, ghosts, satanic possession, human sacrifice. It's got a different spooky story for everyone. Riverdale Road is even supposedly the mortal home to the gates of hell. How can there be any truth to any of this? How did one rural road in the middle of the country get to gather so many weird stories? Well, Chris, get in, loser. We're going straight to hell by way of Riverdale Road. Let's do this. <laughs> Chris, why do you think it's got to be always the most dull surroundings that sometimes inspire the most horrific things in our collective imagination? You know, it's just it's always because the mundane or the mundane is is just part of our day to day lives. And so when something we're familiar with gets, you know, there's an old adage that we, we fear what we, you know, people fear the unknown. Mm hmm. But I, but actually, I think people, yeah, we fear the unknown. But what's really scary is when the known becomes different, becomes menacing. The known known. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's when it's when things, you know, your your childhood home doesn't feel quite right. And there's a noise you can't explain. And there's scratching at the window. And, you know, it's it's those moments where, again, like, you know, when I think about being the most scared I've ever been as a kid. I think about being in my bedroom at my mom's house with, you know, scratching on the windows mm. from or mm -hmm. what I thought was scratching on the windows uh, from outside, from trees or whatever. And, you know, wondering what's on the other side of the glass. Mm -hmm. right? Well, if I just moved those, uh, if I just moved the, the, the blinds away from the window, something could see me what's out there. You know, it's it's those it's those places that are supposed to be safe and supposed to be normal when they're yeah. not. That's the scariest. Yeah. And I agree. Like I so I have 
I don't think I've traveled Riverdale Road. And I will be honest in saying I didn't know anything about it before we start started talking about hometown horror. So I naturally Googled it and started looking into it and did the Google uh, map trip of it. And it is literally looks like so many other roads in Colorado, probably Kansas, probably anywhere in the middle of the country. Like you are literally traveling, you know, just two lanes and there is nothing around. And Google Maps did a nice job of doing it sort of in the winter, but not the winter if it's snowy and pretty, but the winter where it's just sort of everything is desolate and it's the low winter sun. And it does look a little like it looks a little foreboding, but it doesn't look it just looks really mundane. It looks like, man, you know, you you're just trying to get to use that road to get to wherever you're going. Mm. And I think that that's why it's so weird that like all of a sudden this really, you know, mundane, uninspiring kind of patch of land and uh, transportation all of a sudden, you know, there's not just one story about it, right? There's not just like the Riverdale Road of Ripper or whatever, right? There's not that. There's like lots of them, mm. lots of them. And real disjointed ones as well. Like you can start off really slow. So like where to ease in in the first couple of miles. Mm. These like most of the stories that come out of Riverdale Road have this uh, talk about this haunted and eerie feeling that covers the whole surrounding area. I don't know if it's a triangle. <laughs> I'm sure it's got to be right. But it's like this sort of. This, this this desolateness in the area, the people that used to live there, they've moved, they've left behind sort of some empty structures, empty barns. There's sort of a ghost name mm. feeling to it. And it's talked about by Denver Ghost Hunter founder and director, Stephanie Smith, who swears by her experience there. And she said, the first time I investigated Riverdale was many years ago. It was my first lead investigation. And I went out to the road to spot good sites that I thought would work for all of our team and some guest investigators. I was drawn to one part of the road. It was daylight, but there was just something about this spot. As the team psychic, I'm often asked to locate hot spots of activity. All right, so, you know, take what you want from, you know, from that. But, you know, it's again, it's daylight and they're on, they're just in this rural road. That night, we went back to the location and I got out of my car and began to walk down the road. It seemed pretty quiet. You could hear oil drums beating in the fields, but other than that, it was quiet. I decided to walk on the other side of the road for a while. As I was walking, I could see someone ahead of me. The first thing I remember is they had on boots, but otherwise it was very shadowed. Now I have seen ghosts and this one just kept walking towards me. I kept trying to think rationally, but I got more nervous. And then that turned into panic. And at some point in my walk, I turned around and ran the other direction. I ran and ran from the shadow with the boots. Past my team, past the camera crew, past the cars until my head cleared. On camera, they caught a white ball of light zooming past me. After a few minutes, I cleared my head and walked on the other side of the road. I felt fine, no trepidation at all. But every time I walked on the other side, I would still have that panicked feeling. This got me thinking. Maybe this was some sort of imprinted event that only I could see or feel if I stepped on it. So I began to get some volunteers on different nights and have them experiment. I told them nothing of my experience, just had them walk down the road for as long as they could and then come back and tell us what they felt or saw. Some reported seeing a shadowy figure. Others felt scared. Some ran back to the car. Some felt like they were being followed and others just felt ill. We have it captured on video, EVPs and photographs. But the most compelling is the sound of footsteps behind you as you walk along the dark road. I have never found any historical evidence to support this story, but I keep looking. There are just too many people out there that had the same thing happen. God. <sighs> spooky road. So Sorry. spooky. <laughs> so, okay, so again, so like, you know, like what I love too is that they, they do get a white ball of light. So, you know, you have your orb, right? You have a ghost. You have a ghost wearing boots that's coming towards you. You kind of have people feeling ill, right? Which is very common with, um, you know, if you if you look at the, uh, you know, other other haunted phenomena, you feel ill, you feel nauseous, you feel all of a sudden intense kind of paranoia and panic. Um, but then you cross the street and you're fine. 
you know, clearly if this person felt something and kind of did a semi scientific test to validate it. Yeah, I think, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. I think for all for all of this, we got to take people at their word. You know, yep. the the scary thing is the fact that this it's this old idea that like emotional energy or emotional trauma because energy is just thrown around like garbage, right? It's like oh, energy. Mm -hmm. But like the idea that um, strong emotions can leave an imprint on a place that you not only can you, you know, will you remember it as you go back there, but maybe other people in the same area would get the same vibe you did or could feel the kind of bad mojo mm -hmm. uh, that was left behind. Mm -hmm. It's just such a scary, the idea of like a ghost or something following you, the idea of something following you is so scary. Yeah, or walking towards you. It's so scary, yeah, because yeah. it, 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 it suggests, yeah. it suggests that you're, like, you hear stories about ghosts where it's sort of, you know, a ghost is almost like a, like a, a playback of a memory. Mm -hmm. And that's not usually as scary to me at least you know you see a you see a ghostly woman standing on a rock looking out into the ocean like you know oh my lover will come back or whatever mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. less scary than the ghost like looking at you yeah. and being like you're not him yeah. <laughs> you're like oh yeah. shit yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you know that's a lot scarier right the interaction the fact that the thing can see you and maybe do things to you and everything else and you know this idea of this um this idea of like stretches of road or stretches of area that have this sort of bad feeling or negative vibe to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I have, listen, I have lived in areas that are like this where mm -hmm. there are, you know, there's cities, but then you get out into the sticks and there's not a lot out there. Right. And I it's can. really easy to be driving along at night in an area where there's no cell service, where there is, you know, no radio signal, maybe you're between mountains. Mm -hmm. There's one stretch of road in New Hampshire I, I, I immediately thought of when you said this topic to me. That is, every time I drive past it at night alone, I get spooked. I get scared. <gasps> and I'm like a smart, you know, I'm not, I, I consider myself to be like a rational, skeptical, smart person. You know, yeah. but it's just it's just being alone in this area. And like you said, you know, if anything happened, if my car broke down in that stretch of road, yeah, I'd right. be screwed. You know what I mean? Between uh, right. it's it's right. It's between um, it's the stretch of road between Newport and Sunapee, New Hampshire. It is again, it's just super wooded and everything else. It's so scary. So scary. But that's it. Right. I mean, that's the thing that's so. It's so scary is it's like everything's normal one minute, right? And you have kind of control over your surroundings and self in one minute. And you're just doing something that's really mundane, like driving a car. And there's, it's not like you're driving in a storm or, you know, or you're driving, you know, and there's uh, through a haunted neighborhood or anything. It's just sort of this mundane thing. And then all of a sudden something, something happens. Yeah. See, so, but so. And I appreciate the idea of the freeform terror, right? You just get this impression of something, or maybe you see a shadowy figure and it feels like it's coming towards you. But the good thing about Riverdale Road is it has a lot more concrete stuff for you as well. So that's too vague. Okay, well, how about the Phantom Camaro? Bum, bum, bum. Now, this one is, I'm going to admit, is, is my favorite of all the stories. And I'm kind of maybe... Maybe I'm, uh, you know, spoiling it by, by telling it too soon. But this, to me, embodies so many good urban legends and tropes and sort of this general John Carpenter, Stephen King, 70s feel about horror and terror. And this is a story that says, like, back in the 1970s, a black 703 Camaro wrecked along Riverdale Road because there are a lot of blind turns. The driver perished in the wreck, but his ghost remains. If you're driving late at night and you see a Camaro pulled over to the side of the road with only one headlight on, do not approach, do not slow down, and under any circumstance, don't race it. You'll be racing to your death. That's one quote. There's a lot of this out there with people reporting this back on Reddit. One of the quotes reported having the Camaro right behind them. And then you try and go faster and it's still right there. One of them said, the car was getting ready for a turn and we drove past it and it turned behind us. About 30 seconds later, it completely disappeared. We thought it had turned off the road. 
But then three minutes later, it was a foot behind our bumper with its brights on. We were driving at 70 miles an hour down Riverdale, and it didn't stop chasing us until a car passed us in the opposite direction. And at that point, it vanished. So again, you have the you have sort of this this urban legend of the one headlight, right? The one headlight car. It's a Camaro from the 70s, which if, again, you're familiar with the, the 703 Camaro of the 1970s, is just a beautiful, classic muscle car. You know, they perished in the wreck, but they're still seeking vengeance, you know, or their essence is still out there ready to chase you down this, this dark, treacherous rural road. And to me, that is just, that's just like canon, right? That's like, that is, if you're going to have a ghost story, you gotta have that. There's something really just very, I hate to say American to it, but there's just something very classic about that. It is very American, I would say. It's like up there with like the, you know, the ghost train Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. you know, some of the other stuff even that's on Riverdale Road. The idea of like a ghost car, like a ghost vehicle, because, you know, we we put so much personality and emotion into our cars, Mm -hmm. especially, I think. Uh, in the United States where like a flashy car like that is often associated with like youngness and virility. Yep. Yep. Right. So this is yep. like, you know, James Dean careening off the road or whatever. Oh yeah. It's, oh yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. It's such a, Oh my God. Well, and what's awesome is it has always been the Camaro, right? So it does have this personality. So you've got, you know, this, this general sense of foreboding, you know, it was weird. I feel more weird, ill and sort of scared on one side of the road than another. But then on the total opposite end, you have like a very specific car with one headlight that wants to chase you. Yeah. It's right. So scary. But again, I guess so still not impressed with the ghost Camaro. All right, fine. Not your cup of tea. Very well, then. Then how about we stop off at Jogger Hill? So further down Riverdale Road on a dirt road located just beyond 120th Avenue. The story is that a car hit a jogger on the dirt road at the crest of the hill. Now, the driver panicked and sped off and left the jogger there to die. And now their ghost haunts that area and tries to attack any motorist that parks at the crest of that hill just to admire the view. So if at about, you know, 120th Avenue, you come to a dirt patch in the dead of night and you park on the crest of that hill, turn off the engine, turn off your headlights, you wait patiently, you will hear the footsteps of someone running. And then, according to rumor, someone or something will begin to bang on your car. And there have even been claims of handprints appearing on your fogged windows. Uh, it's so scary! <laughs> so, so here's scary. the flip side, right? So here's the, what, what's kind of a nice bookend to this is, to the Camaro is like, so here's someone who was hit by a car right? A jogger who is now just, you know, waiting to take their revenge on, on someone, you know, and has, you know, again, you can hear the footstep, which I think is a pretty good, that's a nice touch, right? Is you can hear them running, getting closer and then someone banging on your car. And again, from Reddit, uh, which I know is maybe not the most reliable, you know, <laughs> for, of accuracy, but what still, do you mean? but still, you know, if you're going for context, this is good. Uh, back in about 2008, a few friends and I went and parked on Joggers Hill with the windows down. I was in the front passenger seat and we heard a loud heartbeat and foots getting closer. I couldn't move my arm that was on the door or talk. And I, all I could do was watch something move in the side view mirror. Okay, so that's, you know, that's nice. That's what, what's what I'm loving about it is it's got like, again, it's got all of the good horror tropes. The thing I like about this one, too, is you are. Again, this this takes like active participation mm-hmm. and the idea, the idea that you can. Again, that you can make it happen on demand is such an important part to these things that, mm-hmm. cause, you know, if someone mm-hmm. just says, like, I got a weird vibe in my house or whatever, like, all right, fine. But if something keeps happening again and again and again, that's the real mark of a good ghost story. You know, that's the that's the best one. That's oh God, Marie, this one was spooky. This is a spooky one. And the thing is, it's like there's a lot of little things, too. Right. That I didn't really get a lot of time to research. But you there's, you know, um, 
bloody handprints that will appear on on traffic signage right so there's like little other little visual stuff that people talk about there's orbs uh there's strange lights but one of the things too that is probably that besides the ghost Camaro and joggers Hill that Riverdale road is known for is the gates of hell. All right, let's, let's get into the gates of hell after this break. I'm, I, I need to get in my blankie. I'm too spooked. All right. Chris here, jumping into this episode to talk about one of our sponsors, better help. If you've listened to the show, you've heard Marie and I wax philosophical about our own mental health ups and downs. Talk about how world events have led to spikes in anxiety or depression and complain about how hard it can be to seek help when you need it. Which is why we wanted to talk a little bit about BetterHelp, a service which will match you to a licensed professional therapist for the safety and privacy of your own home. BetterHelp is not a crisis line and it's not a self-help gimmick. It's professional counseling without the awkward waiting rooms and hoop jumping required to find a therapist on your own. Once matched, you can send a message to your counselor anytime and schedule weekly video or phone sessions from their convenient online system. The service is available worldwide, making great mental health care more accessible for everyone, and you can be matched with a specialist even outside of your geographic area if needed. And changing counselors is free and easy, so that you can ensure you're getting the best therapeutic match possible. Best of all, it's more affordable than traditional online counseling, and financial aid is even available for those who might need it. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener of the show, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash mad scientist, all one word. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash mad scientist. So one of the most common stories is the ghost lady or the woman in white who is walking by these rusted out gates along Riverdale Road. And they're actually out there still. And they're just sort of, again, like a physical remnant of a lot of things uh, in a rural road that were built and are aging. There's a lot of fencing and everything else. But now you are you see this woman in white wandering along and she is the wife of this man who built a mansion and then uh, lost his mind and set fire to that mansion with his family sleeping inside. Now he was this man whose uh, wife is now wandering looking for him and looking for her family was never caught or charged. So as you pass along and you see her The legend is that that is the wife who could appear in your side view mirror looking for help, right, at at the gates of hell. So this gives you a little bit more, maybe a little bit more historical context. So there's an actual physical artifact. There's there's these gates and there is a fire or a mansion that was burnt down. So the interesting thing about this is, yes, there really was a mansion and there really was a fire. It was called the Wolpert Mansion, and it was at 9190 Riverdale Road. And the history of it is is actually kind of interesting. It's uh, David Wolpert was born in 1883 in Ohio. And then in 1859, he began to move west with the gold rush. He followed the Santa Fe Trail to New Mexico and then came back up to Pikes Peak. And he was included in the party of 16 men who traveled to North Park north of Denver, to what is now uh, the Breckenridge area seeking gold. Sausage fest. <laughs> as, as it was back in the gold rush days. Um, but thank you, yes. Uh, Wolpert came to Denver and actually it was started to accumulate wealth. He built the Clayton Block in Larimer Street, downtown Denver, which is historic and pretty well known. He followed the Platte River north nine miles, and on a piece of land he bought in the 1850s, he built a house. So he acquired the land patent from the U.S. government, and his land totaled 145 acres on both the east and west side of Riverdale Road. So Riverdale Road was still out there. It was, at that point, I'm sure, just a dirt 
a dirt road, but he actually was able to purchase this relatively good sized portion of land. Um, he married in 1864 to Catherine Henderson, whose family is from the town of Henderson and who it is clearly named after. And they had a son and two daughters. So um, Mr. Wolpert was a celebrated agriculturalist in his lifetime. And they lived in this mansion for about 50 years. He finally died in 1909 and is buried at Riverside Cemetery, which is another semi-spooky place. So the house itself is a mansion pretty much in the in the strictest sense, in that it was a better house that than most people were living in at the time, right? It was considering when it was built and who built it, it would also have been considered one of the more interesting homes in Colorado at that time. It was two stories. It had other structures around it. And it while you don't think of it as like a mansion as in the sprawling mansions with multiple, you know, multiple stories and and etc. It was for being in the middle of pretty much nowhere around it. It was a a really pretty nice house and would have had pretty good historical um, precedence at that time. There is a complete architectural history that is attached to the house. It's been added onto over the years. There was a brick barn built in the same period. Um, and so again, there's a lot of, there would have been a lot of interest and a lot of renown around just that structure alone. From one of the articles that I read, it said, there is history in human interest rumors alone. It has been said that the mansion was a drover's inn for cowboys, a gambling den in the 1920s, a house of prostitution, a racehorse ranch, and it is said by one of its owners that they became drunk and lost the mansion in a card game. There have also been rumors of murders being occurred on the land. What's interesting, if you look at the house, like, as you can, you can Google what the house looked like, mm -hmm. right, or what the area looked like, I guess. It, it's not, the David Wolpert house isn't, like, super duper... I mean, it's not it's not what you today consider to be like a mansion, like you said. Right, right. You know, but you can definitely see how in this because, again, a lot of us, I think, forget that, like, Colorado was the West. <laughs> you know, it was the Wild West until like the 1930s. So it's pretty fascinating that it was this, you know, I don't know. It's just it's interesting. It's weird looking. It's well. It's, if you look at it now, it's really plain looking. Again, yes. it was. It's a two-story home. However, at the time, with nothing else going on around it, it did garner all of this other, like all of this other attention, which is again just sort of maybe what is leading to the Riverdale Road overall, right? Like starting in the nineteen twenties and even before that. Like it was a den of iniquity, right? There were murders, you know, occurring on the land. It was a house of prostitution. It was a gambling den. So there's all of this stuff that has, you know, that, that ties back to Colorado history, mm -hmm. you know, over time that is just kind of adding to its, its, its historical significance, right? So it's sort of, it's interesting that that may be sort of the linchpin that's driving everything else that people are all the other kind of urban legends that come up around this 11 mile stretch of, of two lane blacktop. Right. It's like, that is the, that is the center point that makes yes. all of it happen. Yes. But, and yeah. again, cause maybe again, it's just started from these really kind of basic, uh, you know, this basic historical precedent of this beautiful home being built there. Um, but again, like the, the person who, who lived in it did not, they didn't, you know, there, it, they were relatively uneventful. They they came with the gold rush, but it was relatively uneventful. But then, 1975, um, when the chicken house, so it had a, a structure, like a large chicken coop that it is referred to as a chicken house, burnt down. The fire department came, extinguished the fire, but the two-story brick home was severely da damaged. And the newspaper, Denver Post, reports, at around 1 a.m. on November 28, 1975, a home located at, at 9190 Riverdale Road became engulfed in flames. The flames Friday left only remnants of the main building plus a smaller structure in the rear. No fatalities or injuries were reported, and the home had not been inhabited at the time of the fire. 
So I think what, you know, you go in and you look at some more of the historical documents and people who reported back on it is the fire department, you know, put in a report to the county health authorities saying it, that the house was a fire hazard and a danger to the community. Uh, the health department also ordered that the owner should dismiss their tenants. So this is where it's a little confusing and I couldn't find anything that was really clarified and that the Denver Post said that it was in it had not been inhabited. However, it sounded like the health department Their actually tenants. said, said, <laughs> yeah, said, get rid of the tenants. You can't move in there because now it's like it's, you know, completely it's completely burnt down practically. Um, so when they moved, when it became vacant is when heavy vandalism started and it's now in desperate need of respiration. And it was, you know, basically it's, it's a historical a site. Sorry, restoration. Oh, my God. OK, it's <laughs> you're good. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> Oh, my God. Okay, the mansion is now in desperate in need of help and restoration. Um, it's a historical landmark. And basically, there's been a lot of local activity in Adams County to have to have it restored. Um, one of the articles that I found that I thought was sort of interesting that talked about the chicken house, right? That are sort of left over was by someone named Charlie Perez, who said back in 1994, 1994, my friends and I went to the chicken coop many times. There were five very large round buildings all connected by a tunnel system. The cages were torn out long ago and obviously there had been a fire. Inside there were a lot of demonic looking graffiti. We often found headless animals, mostly birds, lying on the concrete pylons in the center of the building. It always felt spooky there. And you can actually see some of those photos like you can see pictures of like besides just the mm -hmm. the house itself, like what it looks like now that it's been burnt down. You can also see like if you Google like the Riverdale Gates of Hell or even the Riverdale um, just Riverdale Road like it is. Yeah, it's not um, it's not, not good. <laughs> no, but it's the, the thing being is like I think that it is all explainable, right? Like. You had this house, you know, this house had a, had a history anyways that kind of got almost built up into urban legend in its day. Back in the, you know, the turn of the century, all the way to the 20s and even to this day. And now you kind of have just sort of almost what I would assume is kind of like a snowball effect of you, it had this history. It got burnt down. Um, it had what, again, agriculturally is probably pretty common use, which is you know, chicken coops, a chicken house. And of course it has to be covered because of snow, et cetera, whatever. Um, but now there's like graffiti and it becomes sort of the satanic, you know, the satanic element to it with satanic graffiti and things like that. And I think that that, to me, it's just sort of interesting that historically you can track uh, sort of these events all the way to all the way to the 19, um, you know, until until common, you know, until now, pretty much. So what's interesting, actually, is so I if you go on mm -hmm. some of the articles about it, right, mm -hmm. they talk about some of the people like some of the people who live there supposedly commented. So this is from like 2020. So on that Denver mm -hmm. Library website site, mm -hmm. some of the comments here are. Um, so this one person here is saying, so I won't say their name, but they say, I grew up in this house. What wonderful memories behind the house near what we called the sunroom was a dungeon. At least that's what we called it. Also two room building was on the east side. And then someone else comments saying, I lived in this house, 1952 to 57 left and joined the Navy. Um, this other commenter is my sister. And then someone else says here from the same family says, um, you know, uh, I used to live. What do they say? Hold on, let me find it again. Oh, here. My family lived in this house. It was so beautiful. A black fireplace was in the living room. The stained glass windows were amazing. I have pictures of me by the fireplace. Many wonderful memories. My folks rented the house and farmed the land. So in theory, these are the people who lived there when the fire happened. And there was mm -hmm. the um, what's the word when there was the. Uh, fire that started and, and maybe by the, the madman yeah and the, right, the, the madman or maybe just right. like you know by an oven <laughs> natural occurrences so but really i mean a lot of it is like 
again, if you go back and you try and you try and document, like, when did something happen? Or what, like, what could have started this? That's, you kind of don't have a lot of, you know, uh, a crash, you know, a Camaro crash, or, you know, a hit and run, or things along those lines that could, you could clearly say, all right, well, that's evidence, right? Now, I will say, but there is one exception to this that I do think is very strange that is not talked about in any of those articles that are online about Riverdale Road. And it actually is from a newspaper. It's from the, the Daily Sentinel, which is in Grand Junction from February 28th of 1980. And it says Lee Padell of Clearfield, of Clearfield, I, Clearfield Utah, was driving east on Riverdale Road a mile west of the Webster River when he saw a creature that looked very much like the legendary Bigfoot. I didn't believe in them, but I sure do now, he said. Padilla said the creature ran in front of his headlights. The thing was very graceful. I would say it weighed about 600 pounds. It crossed the road from north to south, and I would estimate that it was running at about 35 miles an hour. I saw it for maybe four or five seconds. Padilla said that he and J.W. Barker of Northern Ogden went back to the site Monday night to check for tracks. None were found. So maybe some skinwalker activity too, Marie. Boom! <laughs> so I'll tell you what you got. You got you got a little bit of everything coming out of this, right? Did You've got weird feelings. You got the ghost Camaro. You got the ghost jogger, the woman in white, the gates of hell. And if all if, uh, you know, if if uh, the Grand Junction, the Grand Junction's Daily Sentinels to be, be believed Bigfoot. You know, what's so funny is uh, so when I was a kid, we had an area like this. We had a bunch of areas like this in Staten Island, you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was, I remember I was with my dad. He was a security guard for a little bit of time. And we, the area of Staten Island that he was a security guard on was like, it's a very rich, um, like, like very rich for the United States part of New York city. And so the, one of the, and there's a lot of wooded, wooded areas and stuff around there. And so one of the areas he used to say, you know, that they had found like uh, the rumor in the area was that there were satanic uh, groups of kids that would go out into the woods and have parties and go crazy and whatever. Oh, satanic and, youth. Well, and then when I was in high school, that was like one of the places you'd go to drink, mm -hmm, you know, yeah. and smoke and like where your parents <laughs> wouldn't find you. So it's <laughs> it's so funny to me that there's these, you know, these areas like there's even a place here in, in Waltham. I was tra I was out looking for somebody's lost cat. And you it's like in a kind of a community, like a, a housing community. And so there's a park and you go up the hill in the park and you go to uh, an area that I guess used to be like a basketball court. And mm -hmm. on that old basketball court, on the old blacktop, there is someone like with graffiti, like put a, a pentagram. Yeah. You know, that's totally. And totally. it's like. That's how these rumors start, you know, but I would have been that idiot kid with the spray paint. Oh, yeah. Putting the pentagram being like, ha this is going to spook out the nerds. Totally. And I, I just think that, again, it's just so to me, the thing that is so fascinating is it's this this stretch of this stretch of. Of highway, right? I'm not even highway. It's just a road. Right. But like it is got huge amount of traction online like but no real like again no real you know um source information on it it's all kind of websites about the most haunted the most spooky the most this and it's written about a lot a lot a lot a lot and to me it's 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 so weird because when you actually are looking at it it's just it's just a really mundane <laughs> you know, it's really mundane. But then, you know, and then you're kind of like, well, I must add ah, all this. But then all of a sudden you just find this one little article of it's like Bigfoot, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, and again, like this guy doesn't have any, you know, Lee Padella of Clearfield, I don't doesn't have any skin in the game for any of this stuff. Right. So it's again, like if you take him at his words, like he saw something and he says it's pretty big, 600 pounds, 35 miles an hour. That's 
whatever, right? That's a pretty sizable, whatever he saw was a pretty sizable thing. So I just, it, to me, it's like, man, you get like 99.9% .9 way, you know, through saying, okay, it's, it's a, it's an urban legend. It's based on history. And then you just get this little 1% that's just like, meep, meep, which is it weird. It reminds me of, it reminds me of like stories about like dead man's curves. Oh yeah, right. So uh, it's got for all the good tropes. So for listeners that don't know what those are, or maybe aren't from the United States, where it's kind of a more like common, um, it's more of a common thing here. I think just like what it's called. Mm -hmm. I think in the UK they're called like uh, hairpins or like switchbacks mm -hmm. or something like that. But essentially, it's these air, it's areas of of highways. So in the United States, I think just generally around the world, there are a lot of roads that are like actually just dark. You can't see what's ahead of you. Because of how dark and how, you know, well, uh, what's the word? Like if there's no moon or no stars out that mm -hmm. night, if it's cloudy or whatever, it's, pr it's pretty close to pitch black at night when you're driving. And so it's really easy for stuff to come up on you out of the road without you realizing it. And so some of the most dangerous versions of this in the U.S. at least are areas of highway where like you're bombing down the road at 60, 70 miles per hour. And suddenly, like, a mountain or a hill comes up out of nowhere. You need to turn. But again, you're driving. It's late at night. You're listening to music. You're whatever. You're messing around with stuff. And you're if, you're not fully, mm -hmm. if you're not fully aware, this thing comes out of nowhere, and suddenly you're, like, careening over the edge or you hit a tree or whatever. And there's a couple of them around there. There's, like, a lot. I've always thought of them as being around, uh, like, California and, like, yeah, Colorado and all of these other areas that are sort of, you know, out West more. Like I, when I think of them, I think of them being out West, mm -hmm. but they're, you know, again, like a real, a real danger for people. <laughs> yeah. Like in there, an actual, that's an actual, yes. Agree. Like it, it, it's got the hairpin or what they call the blind turns, but it's like, there's a lot of blind turns out there that aren't, you know, that don't have hauntings associated with it too, which I think is just sort of this weird mix, right? Like, what came first? Was it the urban legends or the sort of the historic event? And I think, like I said, it's like, well, you can kind of tie it back to the uh, the Walpert mansion and sort of it happening there. But man, that's, you know, it's it's to me, it's just, again, a perfect Colorado horror in that it is something mundane. You think you know what you're getting yourself into and then suddenly it, you don't. So scary, Marie. Oh, God, so scary. I know. And we're just getting started with our hometown horrors. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> All right, dear listeners, next episode, we'll be back with another hometown horror. Thank you again, dear listeners, for listening to the Mad Scientist podcast. I have been your host, Chris Cogswell, joined by my co-host, Marie Mayhew. If you'd like to contact the show, please send us an email at themadscientistpodcast at gmail.com. That's all one word. You can also follow us on Twitter at madscientistpod or at Team Giant Squid for Marie. And of course, you can see us on Facebook, on Instagram, and all over the internet as the Mad Scientist Podcast. And again, our logo is the one with the pumpkin head, so it's easy to see. Mm-hmm. If you've enjoyed the show tonight, please consider supporting us on Patreon where the money that you give to us will help us to promote this show further, to make it better, and just to spend more time making it. Because we love doing that. We do love doing that. Our logo was designed by Carrie Shaheen. Our web design is done by Desdemona Howard. And our sound design is done by Jake Cardinal. Thanks again for listening. <laughs> Thank you. This has been a Damn It Chippy production.